it's that time of year. The hills are alive with the sounds of Davos, but in the Swiss Alps this year, the music's more muted than in the past. No Trump, no Macron, no Theresa May. They've got uh, bigger fires to put out at home. Ten years ago, the World Economic Forum reeled as it gathered weeks after the worst uh, financial crisis in decades. Well, ten years later, the red carpet rolled out for a new generation of uh, leaders who've ridden the wave of a populist backlash against global elites as the high and mighty fret over trade wars, protectionism, a slowing world economy. They're also quietly counting their profits. And yes, 10 years on, far from the rarefied era of Davos, wages for most, well, they've stagnated during that decade. How long can the disconnect go on between the masses and a happy few? What happens when the next crisis rears its head? Today in the France 24 debate, we're asking whether Davos is listening. Joining us, Craig Capitas, editor at large for TRT World. How are you? Bonsoir, mon capitaine. All right. With us as well, Rodolphe Durand. He teaches strategy and business policy at uh, France's prestigious HEC Business School. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Uh, from Johannesburg, Jenny Ricks, global coordinator for the Fight Inequality Alliance. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. And from the World Economic Forum in the Swiss Alps, France 24 business editor, Stephen Carroll. How are you, Stephen? I'm cold, Francois, as you might imagine. <laughs> All right. The France 24 <laughs> debate on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F24 debate. Have no fear, Stephen. It will heat up shortly. Not everyone's <laughs> a no-show this year at Davos. Uh, this Wednesday has seen speeches by such champions of the liberal order as Japan's Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, Germany's Angela Merkel. But it's also been the year of Brazil's new far-right president, Jair Bolsonaro, who's come in pledging to fight corruption, but also cut taxes, uh, deregulate, roll back the socialist principles of the Lula years. And when Bolsonaro says Brazil is open for business, that includes, of course, the Amazon rainforest. Brazil is home to the world's largest biodiversity, and we have abundant mineral resources. We want to engage with partners who master technology so that this partnership brings progress and development for all. Our actions, make no mistake, will certainly attract you to seize great business opportunities, not only for the good of Brazil, but for the benefit of the whole world. Craig Kapitas, uh, Charles Schwab, the founder of uh, the World... Klaus Schwab. Klaus Schwab, excuse me, the founder of the World Economic Forum. What does he make of remarks like that? Look at Davos is an exaggerated sentiment and an illustration of contempt for the dominant majority, the disenfranchised. This is not new. I spent 12 years at Davos. This same argument that we're talking about tonight went on even before I got there. I mean, in this particular case, you've got the president of Brazil saying, come on over and together we'll uh, develop the Amazon rainforest. Effectively, we'll come. All right, yeah. what, what you're getting down here then, in my opinion, is you're getting down to, to not a political question, not an economic question, but a question of philosophy. Uh, I've always felt, particularly over the past 10 years, and I'll get in trouble for saying this, but looking at Davos, despite all of Klaus's good intentions, it really is an illustration of the banality of avarice. Because the World Economic Forum, since its inception 48 years ago, has had a marquee that they put up every year, and it reads, committed to improving the state of the world. And they have not. And I think your illustration of Bolisario getting up and talking about, come on down and cut the trees with us, moments after you have the young princeling from the UK sitting with uh, David Attenborough talking about saving the environment shows this duplicity and why this is 
Davos but, but it, and what's discussed there is really an epistemological But aren't you, aren't you putting too much on the shoulders of what is effectively a talk shop? No, I'm not, because Davos has put this weight on their own shoulders for 48 years. In fact, in 2008, during the crisis, I did an interview with Klaus, and I'm going to give you the quote he gave me. He vowed, starting in 2009, to transform Davos into the Bretton Woods of the new millennium. He hasn't done that. He hasn't gotten anywhere near doing that. In the same breath, I can tell you he'd really like to do that. But the forces of the banality, of greed, of avarice, that has what has, sto has, has stopped him. And I don't know how you deal with that. So I, I think that we can see that there will be, there, there, there have been some changes in the sense that um, maybe some of the talks that we have uh, today look the same as they were before. But at the same time, there are some mounting pressures. We saw some images of the yellow vests in France, but also pressures from uh, investors that, lie, that weigh heavy on actually CEOs, uh, corporations, shoulders. Mm -hmm. And I think that as time passes, has more and more financiers are interested in really non-financial performance indicators that progressively there will be a change in how these people will really react and they will have just to be accountable. All right, let me ask, let me ask yeah. Stephen to pick up on this point. Stephen, uh, it's not your first Davos either. Uh, do you get a sense that uh, it is, uh, well, the, the way Craig described it a moment ago, you know, these sort of two parallel universes at the resort, on the one hand, uh, those that uh, want to do good for the planet, and the others, those who are just trying to network to, to do deals and keep, and all they care about is making money? Or is there, as you just heard uh, from Rodolphe Durand, a bit of a, a bit of a quiet revolution going on. It depends really who you speak to. And, and look, there, there are loads of great quotes about Davos. The one I saw earlier to say that it was a party of people who ruined the world. So it's, you know, there, you do have the, the, the speed dating for CEOs aspect of it. The people are there to do deals, they're there to make money. But in, so this is my sixth Davos and certainly officially on the agenda, the topics have changed. Things that were never on the agenda before became much more important. Elements of discussing technology, elements of discussing climate change, which has become a huge topic for discussion here, officially and unofficially. And issues like inclusion, diversity. There were no LGBT related events on the agenda in Davos the first year that I was here. We have had seen very slow progress in that direction of people actually discussing diversity in the workplace and the need and the advantages of it. So there are conversations that are changing here. There are people in the business world who are making decisions that are you know, lending to climate change. I think of Paul Pullman from Unilever, people who are, you know, making efforts within these massive con global conglomerates to do things that are better for the world. They come here to Davos and they talk to their cohorts. They talk to the 1,700 business leaders who are accredited and the many more who are around this town at this time of year. And d how those ideas percolate down is very difficult to measure. The conversation certainly seems to change from year to year. Uh, so there is an element that it, it feels like the conversation is changing, but when translated into concrete action, it's quite difficult to actually find concrete results that you can point at and say, that happened because of Davos. Jenny Ricks, are, are you heartened by uh, uh, the little changes that uh, Stephen Carroll is describing? Not really, no. I, th I think it's, it's generous. So on inequality... Uh, I would go to the, the quote from um, leading, uh, leading economist Branko Milanovic, who said of, of Davos that they've been singularly unsuccessful in convincing governments to do anything about rising inequality. <laughs> so whilst the debate has changed, the recognition, the recognition of the problem, lots of concern in, in different respects, Davos is not going to be uh, the vehicle through which change happens. It's, it's the same people who caused uh, lots of the problems and who benefit from the current system. Um, we can't ask them or expect them, the same elites, to provide the answers. Why, why would we? So you'll have all seen this week, and there will have been lots of talk at Davos of the new statistics from, from Oxfam, one of our allies, um, showing we're, we're, this year that Jenny, we're, we're, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the wealth. Of we now hold the, the, as okay. much as the bottom half. We're going to talk about that about that Oxfam report a little bit later on. But but I, I want to ask you more specifically, 
what do you make when we heard at the outset uh, an excerpt from uh, Jair Bolsonaro's speech on Tuesday? What do you do if you're organizers at the World Economic Forum? Do you invite somebody like Bolsonaro to come and you meet with them and you confront them or you boycott them altogether? Uh, <laughs> that wouldn't be a decision I would want to make. I mean, D Davos isn't a democratic forum. It's not an accountable forum. So I think if we're looking to uh, looking for answers on, on inequality, looking for how the change is going to come from this broken economic system that we have, this neoliberal system that pushes this free market ideology, that rides roughshod over people's rights, the environment, um, then we need to look to people. We need to look to activists who are organizing around the world, as they are with the Fight Inequality <coughs> Alliance this week in 30 countries, who are pushing for solutions in their countries that, that are going to make a difference for um, greater taxes on wealth, uh, on uh, delivering, on funding public services, um, higher living wages, etc. We need to stop looking at the Davos conversation for solutions and, and start looking at and backing the citizens on the ground who are organizing and trying to hold their governments to account for some of this stuff and make, make real changes. Craig Capitas? If anyone had called the Brazilian president on the carpet after his speech, they would have been blackballed from Davos. You don't do that there. Um, it was probably talked about in some of the bars, but certainly not publicly. Again, I come back to this point. Yes, they change the schedule every year, but the topics remain the same. It's just a difference of branding. And, and there, there is no forward movement. What, let, let's go to a really key point here. The one issue on the opening day of Davos that freaked most of the people out down there was this talk of a 70% marginal tax rate in the United States. They got real scared. Are they talking about that? Of course they're not. In the same way, they didn't talk about the financial crisis coming in. There had been evidence and discussions at Davos five years before the crisis, warnings to all the CEOs that this was going to come. Not one of them listened. And that has continued since then. It is a talk shop, but it's more of a talk shop. It's a pilgrimage, a pilgrimage to a mountaintop shrine where, where you, you get in your uh, Mercedes Maybach and you drive down a street where you should be walking. It, that, that's what this is. It's more than, I, I think it's easy to call it a party for rich people. It's not that. It's a pilgrimage. It's a pilgrimage of the super wealthy. All right, you, Craig's saying the conversation remains the same. Stephen Carroll, this year's theme is called Globalization 4.0. What does that mean? Good question, and that's the same as Craig was just saying with many of the themes of uh, of Davos this year. The why the World Economic Forum explains it is there. It's talking about changing the approach to globalization from an institutional level, from how human capital is uh, looked at by policymakers, how technology is affecting workers, and looking at changing globalization with the aim of inclusivity and bringing more people and reducing inequality. And I mean, you know, I I think that. On the inequality issue, it's it's absolutely right. What we were just hearing is that no, we don't see those statistics getting any better that we have every year from Oxfam. It doesn't it doesn't get any easier for the World Economic Forum to deal with that. But you know, is there is I, there are policies out there that are helping? I mean, on the tax issue, there are debates happening on tax. I've hosted them in the past about uh, chain, taxing multinationals more, which is one of the key demands of Oxfam to try and reduce inequality in public finances. And there are efforts that are being made at an international level that are working, like base erosion, base erosion and profit shifting uh, policy coming out of the OECD, and that's the sort of thing that was birthed within the Davos realm, if you will, the same people that go to Davos are involved in the OECD. It's a different club of rich people. And essentially, there is policy coming out of that that is making changes to how taxation works and is making sure those companies are paying more tax. It's not in force yet, but the architecture is there and is agreed at an international level. So there are some policies that you can point to that are at least linked to conversations that are having here. All right, lots of reactions on the hashtag F24 debate. This one from Nuno. I see this year the WEF opted not to openly discuss the most pressing problems at hand, radicalization of population and prevailing lack of strong leaders. At the same time, there was a red carpet for Bolsonaro. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I wanted to, I mean, let's imagine that we uh, suppress, that, that this event doesn't exist anymore. 
will this change for the better, you know, the situation, the economic situation? I, I would like just to be hopeful and say that uh, even if it's a pilgrimage, maybe it's a place where actually the pressing issues are discussed, maybe not, uh, you know, on stage, but behind the... Uh, you know, uh, behind stage, and uh, that some of these pressing, press, pressing issues in terms of inequalities, in terms of uh, environmental, uh, you know, uh, pollution and contamination are, are mm. taken uh, seriously by some of them, uh, uh, of these leaders. So this is, um, so to the question I just asked, is, are we better with or without? I would like just to see the uh, glass half, em uh, sorry, half full, uh, and and uh, imagine that actually, uh, yes, uh, they are they are dealing with some of these pressing issues. Uh, it's, it's it's so. In other words, it's better to get the Brazilian delegation there, is what you're saying. No, to I, have I was them at least confronted with. Yeah, some of this. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think it's better that he's not being confront confronted. He's he's being mollycoddled. <laughs> that that's that's what goes on there with with all leaders who arrive in Davos, regardless of their politics. Yeah, I, I'm taking a point of view from the, maybe the corporate world, maybe too much. Uh, but um, remember when the COP uh, actually 23 took place in Morocco and Trump, uh, uh, President Trump said that actually uh, uh, America, I mean, the, uh, the United States will leave the agreement. You had 300 CEOs who stepped uh, you know, uh, in and said, uh, well, actually they will just try to uh, uh, respond to the challenges. So this is, this is the half full glass that I would like just to see. So, um, and that in this type of uh, events, this, despite all the symbols and uh, you know the competition among the wealthiest uh, CEO or leader, uh, that maybe there are some. Yeah, J Jenny Ricks. Can I can I come back in on the example um, that was given about Davos being a, a birth? for some of the action that's happened so far on, on tax avoidance. I, I think that's, that's generous in the extreme. I mean, the, the little action that, that's been taken so far on tax avoidance and tax evasion has been, it's been mostly as a result of, of anger that's been growing in societies around the world where they see, where people are seeing uh, large multinationals and extremely wealthy individuals not paying their fair share. That's what's generated uh, the response that we have so far. And in, and in most cases, in terms of wealth and income um, and corporation tax rates, they've gone down um, over the last couple of decades. And it's something that, that needs reversing, uh, as, as was talked about. So I don't think that's a success that Davos can claim. Um, and I don't think they would either, actually. Uh, All right, we're good, but, we're... but I think the point that we have to realize is, is that is that change is going to come from outside Davos, from people, not from the discussions within the halls. How you tackle that growing inequality is what we'll be picking up on when we come back. I want to thank, by the way, uh, Stephen Carroll for being with us out in the cold for the first part of our discussion. The rest of our panelists joining us right after the break. You're watching France 24. Special event. Brexit, a rise in populism and slowing economic growth. There's plenty for business and political leaders to discuss in Davos. But with the likes of Donald Trump and Emmanuel Macron staying away, can the World Economic Forum still draw the attention of the global elite? Join me all this week on France 24 to find out. Watch events unfold on France 24 and France24.com. France 24, every art form. Welcome back. Before we resume the France 24 debate, mass protests in Venezuela's capital as Donald Trump recognizes the Speaker of the Opposition Controlled Parliament, Juan Guaido, as the country's interim president. A symbolic move that ratchets up the pressure on uh, President Nicolas Maduro, who's been staging uh, smaller counter demonstrations. The uh, Maduro appointed Supreme Court opening a criminal probe against Parliament. 
Turkey's president in Moscow to bargain over the fate of border areas once Washington withdraws this as U.S.-backed Kurdish-led forces capture the last big ISIS-held village in eastern Syria. To eastern Syria we will go. France 24's team is there and you'll see their exclusive report on the careful screenings of civilians fleeing the fighting, including the spouses of uh, radical jihadist fighters. And uh, the health scare here in France over uh, the chemicals found in diapers. Manufacturers have been told they have 15 days to come up with a solution. We'll have that story for you as well. Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 debate. Uh, we're talking uh, as uh, the World Economic Forum convenes in the Swiss Alps in Davos, talking about it uh, with Craig Capitas, editor-at-large at TRT World. Welcome back as well to Rodolphe Durand, professor of strategy and business policy at the uh, prestigious French business school HEC. And uh, from Johannesburg, Jenny Ricks from the World uh, Economic Forum. Uh, welcome back to the show as well. Um, the talking points, yes, it's inequality. Uh, it's also, though, uh, a general mood. China's economy uh, already at its slowest level in a uh, decade. And it began with forecasts, this Davos forecast of us, an economy that's going to slow further in 2019, an annual CEO survey by consultants PricewaterhouseCoopers indicates business leaders are braced for the worst. Now, you see in this graph, business confidence still highest among major powers in the United States. But look at how much it's dropped in that graph. China, a drop as well. Germany, where the car industry is adjusting to new anti-pollution norms. That's expected to contribute to a slowing economy there. And the UK, where... Well, it's anyone's guess how badly Brexit uh, will go. Rodolphe Durand, what do you make of, well, the mood of the business community uh, the, at the start of this 2019? Well, uh, I think that there is a, a general concern uh, about the overall economic growth, for sure. But I think that some of the discussions we had previously show that there is also lots of concern about what it is uh, to make profits, what it is a fair compensation for these companies and CEOs, uh, what it is uh, to actually pay taxes and where. So I would say is there is the general concern of the economic growth, but there is also the um, general concern about what is acceptable for society and societies. Uh, uh, you know. and, and that, by the way, that Price Waterhouse Cooper survey, uh, it, sh it shows up how much we're talking across purposes. You're talking about more awareness of the environment, of uh, yes. civic responsibility. The number one concern of those CEOs in that in in that survey, too much regulation. They say. Well, <laughs> so we're going back to square one. Um, well, I think we, we, we should not be manichaean in uh, in seeing you know um, uh, regulation as something that uh, top uh, executives <coughs> dislike. Because they are also uh, contributing, actually, to uh, fabricating and uh, creating the different regulation and laws. So, uh, will I say that there is a bit of hypocrisy in uh, uh, in this answer? I think it's the typical answer that they they will give, and in some cases, they are very happy about you know helping governments finding the right regulations mm. to protect their industry and, and, and stuff. So let's let's let's. Right, I, I won't take this uh, this answer as I mean I, I take it as no, the, the, the regular answer. The, Chi the Chinese have a wonderful solution to economic disparity, according to a Forbes study I just read in 2011. There were 115 billionaires in China. Since then, 72 have died. 15 were murdered. 17 suicides. Seven accidental deaths. 19 by illness. 14 were executed, according to Chinese government figures. I did a little calculation. That's a dead billionaire every 40 days. So when people make too much money in China, it seems like the Chinese Communist Party apparently knows, knows how to handle this. Now, that's excessive. But the whole issue here, the, the Price Waterhouse Cooper stats, what I think what Jenny said before we went to break was right on the money. Davos has had absolutely zero to do 
with with taxes and on trying to raise tax rates on uh, corporations, that uh, there Davos now it, 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 I hate this phrase but it works. It's past its sell by date. There needs to be some kind of Davosian gathering, which really takes on the philo philo and I'm, forget economics, forget politics, the philosophical components of greed. When is too much money really too much? Because that's what the issue is here when you get right down to it. And the Davosians have been dancing around this issue for the past 25 years. And we, that's why we come here every year. We basically have the same discussion. And again, I think this is a philosophical question. It's, a, it's epistemological. You know, the difference between justified belief and opinions, that is never discussed at Davos. And you try to bring it up, you're slapped down. Try to bring it up and, and you're slapped down. Uh, and uh, Craig Capitas mentioning that uh, just weeks after being sworn in as a first-time congresswoman, Alexandria Ocampo-Cortez uh, managing to uh, grab the conversation in the Swiss Alps. She has the whole of the U.S., in fact, talking about her suggestion of a 70% tax bracket for top income. She spoke to CBS's 60 Minutes. There's an element where, yeah, there, people are going to have to start paying their fair share in taxes. Is that... Suddenly this Let's is... Let's break this down, because... Um, She's talking about marginal rates. That is not to say they're going to take 70% of your money like they used to do in France, even if you made a nickel. They're saying there's going to be a, a, a top rate. If you're making more, let's just take a number. $10 million a year, we're going to tax you a bit more. That philosophical debate I'm talking about is what that number is. Are you surprised at how much traction she's gotten since making this? Well, thing? sure, because there are very many economists who... who say that this is the way to go. It used to be the way in the United States up until uh, the end of the Eisenhower administration. But again, it lets uh, the, the, the devil, as Perot said, is in the details. What's the magic number? And on top of that, there's one other point. It's not just your personal income tax. It's the corporate rate. You tax the corporation, not the individual. That's another debate, philosophical perhaps, that needs to take place and isn't taking place. Jenny Ricks, I, I don't know if you've been following the Yellow Vests movements uh, here in France, but <coughs> one of the uh, surprises for uh, journalists is just how much those protesting are, are talking about fiscal policy. They could argue about tax brackets and corporate versus yeah. individual income mm -hmm. tax. Are you getting the sense that worldwide this conversation about what's fair when it comes to taxes is really emerging in the last couple of years? Yes, it is. It's emerging uh, in the global north and in the global south because I, I think it's, it's an issue that's so material to people's everyday lives. And, Precisely. Um, and people understand the amount of money that's going to be in their pockets uh, at the end of every month. And they can see who at the top of society is, is frankly getting away with it. Um, we had recently some of our Fight Inequality Alliance Kenya um, allies were campaigning on the budget in Kenya against measures that the government was introducing where there were VAT, uh, there were taxes on children's school books, which is obviously a core thing if you're thinking about everyday needs and reducing inequality and getting children to have a chance in life. There was VAT on children's school textbooks, but not on helicopter spare parts. So who is that budget for? It's a budget for the rich and people know it, they, they recognize it, and they are organizing against it, whether it's um, you know, the, the, the discussion you're raising on the Gilets Jaunes, uh, people's reactions to Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's proposals. This stuff is mainstream, and people get it. It's mainstream, uh, but uh, we've seen both in the United States and in Brazil those fed up uh, with uh, what they perceive as injustice. Uh, who have they elected? Uh, leaders who are, are, are cutting taxes. Yeah, I, I think in a, we have to take a step back and see in we have such hugely unequal societies and 
People have, have been at the receiving end of an incredibly broken and rigged economic system that's seen wealth explode, few people at the top of society getting supremely wealthy, while ordinary people and those at the bottom are having public services squeezed, are, are having their tax contribution raised, um, they're being uh, discriminated against in, in, in all kinds of ways. They're feeling stagnating wages, unemployment, etc. And into that uh, vacuum, if you like, I think um, the, the kind of far right, the populist leaders on, on that end of the spectrum have been able to enter a vacuum where people don't have faith in politics and the status quo. And they've been able to manipulate the conversation so that people end up punching out uh, mm -hmm. at, at others in society. People become othered and become marginalized, whether it's migrants, whether it's indigenous people, whether it's people of different sexual identities, you, you name it. They're, they're being encouraged to punch out rather than punch up at the elite. See, where, where Davos can contribute to this debate and doesn't is the rate that you put on a corporation. As far as the individual tax rate, that is a national issue. You can't make that super uh, an international issue. But Davos should be the place where we can say, how much of a, how much of a tax bite should we put on corporations? I'm all in favor, for instance, of getting rid of regulations. You know, uh, we'll have arguments over that. But as far as the corporate tax, that 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 needs to be raised, and that's something that the Davosians should be dealing with in a very serious manner. And I don't hear them doing it. I think also that there is something that is interesting to to mention, which is the fact that more and more the negative externalities of some uh, firms and corporations are made, made more visible every day. Yeah, and we that, live in this new era of transparency where yes. people are, mu it's much easier to see it. And yes. so therefore, and it's more the outrage re is there because yes. we're getting more figures, yes. right? Yes, and there are actually discussions about the very, defi def the very definition of legal statuses of firms, such as limited responsibility, for right. instance. I got to interrupt you there, Rodolphe Durand. I covered the French finance ministry in the 1990s. And back then, the finance minister was talking about how we're going to crack down on tax havens, we're going to crack down on corporations that don't pay their fair share. It's nearly 25 years later. Yeah. But you, you have some, you have some uh, you know, uh, initiatives that uh, would say that maybe changing the legal statuses of firms by saying that actually limited responsibility of the shareholders should be changed and uh, actually yeah, we should it, increase some, you're, you're some of the you're responsibility. Making, listen, you're making a terrific point. But let me be devil's advocate here, okay? I'm working for one of the firms that you're now trying to fix up. Take Renault, where the, 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 we're, we're discovering now that the, the boss is paying themselves through this uh, company in the Netherlands. Uh, obviously legitimate, obviously legitimate, and here's my point. I mean, that's a, that's a good illustration, because the moment you bring that up, you know what? My company has more lawyers than your government has or, or uh, uh, Jenny's NGO. And, that, and that's part of the problem, because what companies do in this issue, when you go after them on these kinds of issues, they will say, bring it on. Look at what Google and, and the yeah. other uh, big digital firms are doing here in Europe over that, their yeah. tax problem. We'll see you in court. And guess what? Google can bury the EU's lawyers, they got more money, they got better lawyers, and they can have a drag you on. You used very interesting the term, uh, it's legitimate. I mean, referring to uh, what uh, Renault did with the holding in uh, yeah. Netherlands. It's not legitimate. It's illegal. And I think that the difference that we are facing these days yeah. is that profit is, is legal, in, and actually tax, I won't say, I mean, ev evasion or, you know, mm. uh, optimization, as uh, some people say, that, is legal, but yeah. it becomes illegitimate for many, many people. And that's the epistemological point yes, right that you were, there. Yeah. That's where this argument, which has been going on for decades and decades, steps out of the political economic arena and actually does become, I'm, sh I'm certain of this, a philosophical question. And, and, and that's the route where it needs to be addressed. But I think I it, it will become quite soon an economic condition when actually this illegitimacy of some of these uh, practices mm -hmm. uh, will start costing money. Are we hearing it? Are we hearing it here in France, for instance? I mean, we're going to have a board meeting of Renault on Friday, is it? Uh, uh, Thursday, yeah. Thursday, yeah. is there is there anything going to change? Yeah, the first question that, the first question that those two fellows who they're going to bring in are going to ask What's our legal liability if we take this job in Japan? If we go there, do, uh, is there a chance that we might 
get arrested because there's no love lost between the Japanese and the French over this. Make no secret about it. You know, Ghosn is being hung out to dry. Carlos Ghosn would never go into any deal unless his lawyers had looked at, at it left, right, and center before he signed it. So it gets back to this point of illegitimacy versus legality. Legality, yeah. Which is an excellent point. And he, is, it, is it changing, though, Jenny Ricks? And you, again, you mentioned... Uh you mentioned that uh, growing disconnect between the super duper rich and the rest of the planet. Is it, is it at all changing? We're aware of it more. We, there's consensus on the panel about that, but is it changing? I think, uh, I think aspects, well, the conversation is starting to change, uh, which, is, which is a good thing. I think there's agreement on the problem or the, the, the pro that it is a problem, both uh, in terms of this huge obscene inequality that we have, the kinds of egregious tax avoidance um, that people are talking about. I think there's agreement on the problem. Now the issue comes in terms of solutions and what's, what's going to create change. And I think people around the world on the sharp end of these inequalities have don't have faith in Davos. They're not looking to Davos and the elites there for solutions. And to a certain extent, they, they are lacking faith in their own governments. But what people are doing around the world as, as part of the Fight Inequality Alliance and with other social movements that you see popping up is, is taking matters into their own hands to organize, to build their own power, because it's only really by people coming together outside of the elites and demanding accountability, demanding progressive changes, that changes happen. If we look back through history and we see the major changes um, that we've been able to achieve in terms of social progress and social justice, whether it's ending slavery, votes for women, big changes that, that, we, that we kind of hold up, it's ordinary people organizing together across society. All right. uh, and that, that's what's starting to happen here. We have, the seed, we have the seeds of it. We have the seeds of it. Someone who would agree with you is the founder of the World Economic Forum. Klaus Schwab insists you have to take the long view on the world economy and also on Davos. Let's take a historical view. When I created the World Economic Forum in 1971, people were very concerned uh, with all aspects of life. Uh, look at uh, very few democracy at the time. Um, if I look now, um, nearly 50 years later, just one simple fact, life expectancy on a global level since 71 has nearly grown by 20 years. Uh, many more people living not in poverty anymore, percentage-wise, even in absolute terms. So we should look also of what we have achieved. And the world will always have to face threats, but there are opportunities. Craig Kapitas? Klaus Schwab is an irony because he is more in concert and in agreement with the Congresswoman Cortezes of the world and, and, and what Jenny's talking about than he is with the people at Davos. I've seen that every year that I've been there and every interview I've done with him. He had told me that it just got out of control. He has a lot to be proud of. But if I may, I have a question for Jenny, which fascinates me. How do you, how do you go about judging avarice and greed? Do you do it by quantity, by uh, awareness, malevolence? How do you go about, from your perspective in the trenches, to decide whether someone is, is making more than what we could say is their fair share? How do you reach that conclusion? I think it, it's reached such extreme levels that it that it isn't it isn't so hard to judge because it's becoming a smaller and smaller number of people at the top of societies who are grabbing power and wealth. So you know the Oxfam statistic this year, which does the brilliant job of holding up. The mirror to us of the broken system is, is it's now 26 people who have the same wealth as the bottom half of humanity in economic terms. Um, so it, it, it's reached such ri ridiculous, outrageous levels that it, that it isn't hard to draw the line. I think people know uh, it, it, in societies around the world who's, who, has, who has huge wealth um, 
And who's calling the shots? You know, these the the political and economic circles um, close with each other, which is part of the issue with Davos. So I think um, I, I think we're talking about such extremes, such extremes that um, that it that it's kind of very easy to. And and the other statistic I liked this year, which which draws that out for us, is that in the last year alone. Um, the billionaires have increased their wealth by 12%, and the bottom half of humanity, the wealth has decreased even further by 11%. So things are actively still going in in the wrong direction. Actively it's not still going. Just that we've reached this horrific extreme. It's it's getting further. It, it, there was a French philosopher about a decade ago, Rodolphe Durand, who talked about the eight to one ratio. That there there should be a rule that the CEO yes. of a company could make at the most eight times more than the lowest paid uh, employee. Do you think yeah. there should be some kind of law or something for that? Uh, my opinion is no. Yeah. I, I think... Yeah, the, I, I think... <laughs> so I, I think that this this has to be, um, you know, uh, let, let free in a sense that... Uh, I, I'm not saying that uh, I, I justify, you know, the extreme wealth. This is not what I'm saying. But the ratio one to eight, I mean, why, why one to eight? I'm much more in favor of leaving the freedom of the different organizations to define their, their own governance. Uh, some organizations may want just to, um, you know, define their own mission. Some uh, and in this mission there will be actually uh, environmental concern or mm -hmm. social concern, and here you define a, a certain uh, you know governance system and compensation system for family firms. It could be completely different because you have long term mm. uh, patrimonial objectives. For stock uh, listed firms, it's a different game. So I think that I would go against you know uh, just having one rule: you cannot earn more than eight times the uh, median uh, salary. It's not the personal income; it's the corporate tax. Yes. That that's where the rubber meets the road on this thing. It's very easy to point to a right. billionaire and say you got too much money. All right. So yeah. sh shooting billionaires is not the answer. Says it's Craig not. Craig. Many I, thanks. I, I, I want to thank I, I want to thank Rodolphe Durand, Jenny. Unfortunately, we're run out of time, but I want to thank you so much for being with us from Johannesburg. Stay with us. Media Watch is next. And we say hello to Alexander Arcott. Hello there, how are you doing? Not so bad. Good, good, good. So, um, yeah, we're talking about uh, Greta Thunberg, um, because obviously there's a lot going on at the Davos Forum, but this 16-year-old uh, student from Sweden, she's uh, become an unlikely star of this year's um, forum. Of course, uh, earlier on in the year, uh, last month, in fact, she um, came onto the stage at the COP24 uh, talks in Poland and uh, she uh, spoke up for climate change and that became a, a very powerful um, message from her. And she's now coming forward to say that she dares um, the, the people at Davos to actually come up with uh, answers for climate change. Um, she took a, a full day to travel to there from Sweden by train, putting a lot of the, um, the, the fat cats at Davos to shame. And it's been pointed out, actually, that this year... To lower her carbon footprint instead of flying in. Yeah, exactly. Right. And it's been pointed out that this year um, that 1,500 individual private jets have been flying in and out while they're supposed to be talking about tackling climate change. And, um, and there's a certain amount of one-upmanship with this, you know, bigger jets than ever before, everyone trying to... Uh, Try, trying to have the, the flashiest jet and sort of completely ignoring the message. Now, this is the um, post that she's put up um, calling for people to fight climate change because they're not doing enough. She says this film was shown inside the WEF today and uh, it's about just over a minute long, but uh, I've got a little clip of what she's been saying. Some people, some companies, and some decision makers in particular has known exactly what priceless values they are sacrificing to continue making unimaginable amounts of money. I want to challenge those companies and those decision makers into real and bold climate action. I don't believe for one second that you will rise to that challenge, but I want to ask you all the same. I ask you to prove me wrong for the sake of your children for the sake of your grandchildren, for the sake of life and this beautiful living planet. 
Rodolphe Durand, some people might say, oh, she's being uh, used or instrumentalized by others. I, I don't think so. I mean, to the best of my knowledge, she really started, uh, you know, like, you know, protesting uh, against the, you know, school uh, system in, in Sweden. So at the very beginning, at least I would say no. I mean, for the time being and now, I don't know who is backing her, etc. But uh, I think that their um, talk, her gesture is very genuine and actually is very uh, Quite good. This, touching, one, this yeah. is one of sh the snares yeah. that Schwab has used over the decades to get people there to listen. Unfortunately, in the past, it's never worked. But this has Klaus written all over it. And good on him for doing it. Mm. And, and her speech, even though she's 16 years old, as you see, very mature, very mm. powerful, the way she's, she's mm. there, saying to the people in Davos, you know, I don't think you will actually change, and I challenge you to prove me wrong. Um, so the World Economic Forum on its Twitter page has uh, put, put that message up, uh, message up there. Um, other um, news outlets, um, eyewitness news from South Africa, saying the Swedish teen teenage has upstaged today's events, upstaged China, upstaged Brexit, upstaged Europe. Uh, talking about these things, and um, yet, yeah, and on uh, social media, a um, lot of people getting behind her. Um, uh, she, she's using the uh, hashtag whatever it takes. So we need more people in this world willing to do whatever it takes to make the world better. And uh, fighting climate change, whatever it takes, is uh, it, 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 and she's really uh, ch challenging people to come up with uh, ideas to fight climate change. All right. Uh, no Macron, no, um, uh, no Trump, no Theresa May, but we do have New Zealand's prime minister. Indeed. And a lot of people coming forward to uh, ask for Jacinda, uh, Jacinda Ahern to uh, be the leader of their country. She's been talking on forums and uh, gave a speech earlier on in which she has been one of the people talking about uh, these issues. And uh, we get uh, she, she's proposed this well-being bud budget and lots and lots of comments on uh, online uh, talking about uh, great vision and uh, asking for her to come forward and be the leader in their country. Huh. And to make has, has anyone mentioned that while she's there, New Zealand posted figures that they have the highest house prices in the world and people down there can't afford homes, so be careful what you wish for. All right. <laughs> Many thanks, Alexander Alcott. I want to thank our panel. Thank you for joining us here in the France 24 debate.